I want to share an interesting experience with you, and that is I spoke to Matt Slick on my website, I guess. This guy has a website called CARM.org, or C-A-R-M.org. Not sure exactly what it stands for. Christian Apologetics Research Ministries, or something like that, maybe? I don't know. There's quite a bit on that website, uh, but he's a Calvinist, and you know I've talked about how Calvinists... Calvinism is wrong a lot, and I want to do a lot more, which is ironic because I started looking over some of my Calvinism studies the other day, uh, trying to finish them up so I can make more videos on them soon, which I'll talk about it plenty eventually when I get around to it. But anyways, he's concerned that I'm causing division in the body of Christ because I have Calvinism listed under Doctrines of Devils on my website. And so we debated a little bit. I've had plenty of debates with Calvinists and I um, thought it was interesting that, you know, I visit his website and I've seen him on YouTube and stuff. So it was kind of surreal for him to be here. And I'm pretty sure it was him. It could have been somebody being a fake. I don't know. But he let me talk to him on Skype. Um, but anyways, you know. I told him he's pretty much wasting his time because I'm dead set against Calvinism. And, you know, he tried to go to the Greek and tried to say this, and he tried to take me to this verse, this passage. Uh, this is examiningcalvinism.com, which they refute Calvinism. I think it's a very good website for that, except for they do teach that a born-again Christian can lose their salvation, which is false. But I'd say like 80 to 90% of what they have on here is pretty accurate. It's very useful one way or the other. And uh, so he, he told me about 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 14. It says, the, the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, for I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his son's brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So if you're against Calvinism, you know, you say, well, Jesus died for the sins of the world. He died for the sins of everybody. Um, you know, everybody has the opportunity or the option to turn to Christ. Of course, Calvinism teaches that Christ preordained some individuals to be saved, and he preordained many individuals to be damned, okay, without any options of repentance, which is absolutely false. Makes God, you know, the author of evil, makes him a tyrant, and maligns the character of God. There's so many problems with Calvinism, and it's so completely wrong in how they twist the scriptures. But they'll use this, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 14, and they'll say, well, did Jesus really die for the sins of all, every individual, for the world? Because this says that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. They shall not be atoned for. So, so therefore, Jesus didn't atone for everybody. And, you know, I told him, I looked at it and gave my opinion on it, and I said, this is like comparing apples to oranges. This has nothing to do with the sacrifice of Jesus. It's not, you know, in view in this verse. It's taking it out of context. And he's like, well, it doesn't have anything to do with the sacrifice of Jesus. You know, that's a sacrifice. So this says that, you know, their sins will not be atoned for by any sacrifice or any offering forever. And, and Jesus, you know, that includes his sacrifice, that includes his offering. No, it doesn't, okay? Um, so, anyways, and so I told him that. It's like comparing apples to oranges. He's taking this out of context, and I tried to... I went to this website examining Calvinism. I told him about it. And so they explain things pretty much the same, maybe a little differently. They say that the curse that was on Eli's house was not the curse to damnation. Okay, so, let's see, you know, see, there's no mention in the prophecy of 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verse 28 through 36, that says that the curse on the house of Eli was that 
every one of its descendants, however many thousands of them, were all going to hell as an alleged generation of children going, growing up as priests and servants in the Lord, all being born damned, for which there was no atonement to save them. Rather, the untonable curse on the house of Eli was premature death, poverty, and the loss of its priestly heritage. And there was no sacrifice or offering that would atone for or reverse this judgment. So the argument is not whether I deny that the curse was unatonable. The argument is what exactly was that unatonable curse? It, was it a curse to damnation, or was it a curse to premature death, poverty, and loss of its priestly heritage? First Samuel chapter 2, verse 28 through 36, First Kings chapter 2, verse 26 through 27, and First Samuel chapter 22, verse 22, which would show that the curse is to premature death, poverty, and loss of its priestly heritage. If it was a curse to damnation, you need only ask whether Abiathar is in hell or Ahimelech or in the 85 priests of Nob in hell. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 14 through 23. There are similar types of curses in the Old Testament as with the house of Eli, such as the curse on the house of Gehazi, I don't know how that's pronounced, servant of Elisha, receiving the unatonable curse for being lepers forever, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 27. And so what will not atone for the sins of Eli's house? The blood sacrifices and offerings performed by the Old Testament priests would not appease God's anger in order to change his mind concerning the judgment which he had decreed upon the house of Eli. God denied atonement from that curse. So, I mean, it's talking about the blood sacrifices and the Old, the Old Testament offerings and stuff. Not, nothing to do with the atonement of Jesus. Um, you know, like I said, it's apples and oranges, and the, the curse was not to damnation. So that's a very good point as well. Does 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 14 address whether Jesus died for the house of Eli? And the answer is no. Okay, so they're trying to make this verse prove a doctrine or something that it doesn't teach. They're taking it out of context. Absolutely. Absolutely, they're taking it out of context. It doesn't speak anything of the atonement of Jesus for the sins of the world, for all mankind. Did Jesus die for the house of Eli? And the answer is yes, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. John chapter 1 verse 29, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1, having come as the Savior of the world, John chapter 12 verse 47, there is no verse in the Bible which states that there are some people that Jesus did not die for. And that's what they're trying to prove. And how wicked is that, to say that Jesus didn't die for some people? I mean, Calvinism is absolutely wicked. It is doctrines of devils. And so this Matt Slick guy is very contentious, contentious. It really surprised me. I guess now I kind of understand his character a little bit more. Um, and, you know, I talked to him about John 3.16, and he tried to explain away whosoever with the Greek and say that it doesn't really mean whosoever. It means whoever is born of God or something. I don't know. But uh, absolutely crazy, man. And then we talked on Skype, and so I told him my opinion on this first, and then I looked up this website and I showed it to him. And I was trying to tell him, you know, if you think that me speaking bad against Calvinism is causing division, I was like, why don't you go to examining Calvinism because they have a much larger audience than me, okay? You should go debate these guys, you know, go to the big boys because, you know, I, I've studied this a lot and I mean, I'm 100% confident that Calvinism is false, but... You know, like I said, this website, like a lot of people are going to go to this. It's a very good resource for refuting Calvinism. And, uh, you know, this is who we should deal with. So I was trying to bring him to this and show him, you know, whatever verse he brings to me, I'm going to come here and look at it. And then he's all like, well, he's like, you're not doing the research. He's like, I do my own research. And I was like, well, you sound a little bit self-righteous, buddy. And I was like, don't you have a website to like teach people and stuff like you're being kind of hypocritical or, you know, are you going to condemn people for coming to your site to learn? Then why, why do you even have it? Why are you trying to teach people if you're against anybody going to a website to, to learn things, you know, or as a helpful resource, you know? So, I mean, I agree with most of the stuff that they say on here, 
you know, I compare it with scripture and it's true. Calvinism cannot be compared with scripture. It's absolutely false. It makes God the author of evil. It makes God a mocking God when he says that God commands all men everywhere to repent when, you know, all men can't. You know, it doesn't mean just the elect. It's absolute craziness. But Calvinists are very contentious as a whole. I should have expected it. But uh, I don't know. It came off as a little bit self-righteous and disrespectful to me. And, you know, I tried to tell him that it's just a waste of time because I'm not going to convince him, he's not going to convince me, and we're just going to go around in circles. And, you know, so I kept it going for a while, but now it's done. So, just uh, thought I would share that experience. It was pretty surreal. Who knows who else will come to the website or, you know, who else will come across and, and want to debate or whatever. But, wow. Calvinists are in it over their heads, and it's got to be very hard to convince one of them who's been a Calvinist for a long time that their doctrine is wrong. I'm going to guess that he went to a seminary. It could be wrong, but he's probably very indoctrinated, you know, even though he talks about studying things for himself. Uh, I'm just, I'm really surprised. And, you know, after I told him that he was self-righteous, that he seemed a bit self-righteous by what he said about you know, him not having to research things from other people or whatever. And he's like, oh, insulting much or whatever, like I insulted him. Oh, my. Wow. Anyways, I don't know what else to say right now. I could probably talk about it more later, but that's about all there is to it. He's just a Calvinist heretic, and the same old Calvinist arguments, the same old misrepresentation of Scripture, misrepresentation of God. Um, you know, and he says that Calvinism isn't the gospel to him, but yet he's so very concerned about it. That's okay. Oh, oh God bless. Love you guys. Don't be a Calvinist. Bye. <laughs>